this is actually a special 90 minute broadcast where we are looking at 10 specific questions and trying to get you answers to those questions. Now these are, these are the questions about our India's trust, uh, testing strategy. Keep in mind that two weeks of lockdown are done, one more week is left. What happens then will depend on what we show as results this week. Just how many cases have we got, how much we have been able to test, how many hotspots do we have, what is it that are India's numbers showing. Now, for us to understand all of this, there is a new term that's actually come into focus, which is rapid testing. Before I go to that, let me tell you the 10 questions that we are seeking answers to. In the first round of the broadcast, we answered the first five questions. The first five questions were, what to do if I have fever and cold? Where can I get tested for coronavirus? If hospital turns me away, what options do I have? Can the hospitals even do that? Question number four was, what to do if someone around me shows symptoms and question number five was what is rapid testing now the questions that we will be referring to are about does india have enough testing kits that's the first question we'll look at then question number seven which is should all states go in for rapid testing or should we focus on some to begin with and then take a call on our overall strategy question number eight what is the difference between a swap test and a rapid test question number nine why are there few states in our country like Maharashtra who are unsure about rapid testing or don't want to come on board? Are there any concerns regarding this method? And question number 10, will rapid testing help us determine our next strategy? What happens post April 14th after this specific lockdown period has come to an end? Now, let me explain to you what is rapid testing as we know it. It can detect infection just through a prick on the finger it's very simple it's like any of your other home uh, you know home testing kits like your pregnancy care, uh, testing kit it helps you detect whether or not you're showing symptoms and you have coronavirus test results can actually be delivered in 30 minutes so right now people are having to wait from one day to two day but this rapid test kit can actually give you results in just 30 minutes uh, it is can be used for people who are showing influenza uh, symptoms Experts suggest you should perhaps wait for three days with these symptoms before you carry out this test. The probable co co case of COVID-19 is what is that finding if you test positive with a rapid testing kit. And of course, apart from the fact that this kit has given you results, it's always advisable to go ahead and get it rechecked via an RT-PCR test, which is what we're usually doing right now. So that being said about rapid testing, Let's get on with the fact and, uh, that once these kits come, what should be the strategy? Is India testing enough right now? How much more should we be testing? Let's say good evening to the panelists who are joining us right now. Dr. Suranji Chatterjee, Senior Consultant for Internal Medicine at Indraprast Ho Apollo Hospital. I've also got uh, uh, Dr. Velumani, Chairman and MD of Thyrocare Technologies who joins us this evening and Dr. Subhash Salunke, Senior Advisor with PHFI and Officiating Director for IIPH in Bhubaneswar. Uh, Dr. Velamani, let's begin with you. We've had you on our, uh, you know, on, on our shows earlier as well, where I, I, I believe we did have a conversation on how much testing should be done. Now, with over 1 lakh samples tested, two weeks into this lockdown, what's your view? Are we testing enough? We are not testing adequate. We are testing in a few pockets. We are testing only in areas where the uh, uh, approved laboratories are existing, some 100 kilometer radius. There are some states, hardly single lab is there. So the state doesn't have adequate testing. So if you ask me for a size of 1.3 billion, if we don't do at least a million tests, we wouldn't ever know what is the extent of current level of transmission and it would be very difficult to understand even to what extent this disease has reached to rural rural of the india and what is the reason behind that purely because we don't have enough testing kits right now see obviously the cost is a big uh, challenge the government doesn't have adequate uh, uh, a capacity and the kids to do the test, though they have roped in private uh, laboratories. And private laboratories also have to charge, and the rate agreed was 4,500 by ICMR. 
but that is too big money for india indians to pay and also indian government to pay so the big challenge is we don't have a adequate capacity b we don't have adequate capacity to pay for it so both put together has limited but having said that i think in this last one week or 10 days we have scaled up significantly if the slope sustains and in another 10 days we would have at least a 5 lakh test done in another 10 days time i believe it is in right direction now but if you look at cumulative all tests done it is too little for the size of the country okay so you know you you're right and I, and I, and i was also you know just going through the statistics that we have on how many more testing kits we are about to get and the government has said that they have uh, you know ordered about 7 lakh rapid antibody testing kits uh, and we'll be getting 5 lakh uh, testing kits on april 8th which is tomorrow so the first phase actually gets delivered tomorrow and we're also looking at 10 lakh rt pcr testing kits uh, that will be procured keeping this in mind will it be will will it be okay to say that we have enough testing kits dr chatterjee or do you believe that we need to really ramp up on maybe indian made kits or uh, importing a lot more at the moment i think the number of kits are okay but depending on the number of cases and the size of population that we have in the next couple of weeks we really need to ramp up the number of kits available to us at least initially the lockdown was introduced that was the right step so that we have time to uh, so that we have time to seclude people to assess the situation of our healthcare system to assess how many kits we require now this is the time when we should ramp up the number of kits this is the time when we should start testing more as compared to what we are testing because once the lockdown period uh, approaches when when it's to be finished we need to decide as to which are the areas to be kept under lockdown or it is to be extended or there has to be a staggered lockdown so we definitely need to ramp up the number of kits and we need to do more number of testing from now onwards <clears throat> what would be the extent of testing uh, you know the, the that would be required for us to have a clearer picture and perhaps then look at a further strategy post lockdown yeah obviously see this lockdown has given us time to prepare as the number we, we will be able to isolate the hot spots we know where the migrants have gone where the evacuees are there which are the areas which have got which have reported more cases from that from the then from the total number of cases from the total of deaths the areas we need to ramp up the test this is the government and the icmr would obviously sit down to decide in the next two three days as to where we should concentrate more Okay we seem to have lost that feed with you we're just going to get back to you Dr Chatterjee but let me bring in Dr Salunke as well on this conversation Dr Salunke just about a lakh samples tested so far what would uh, you know what should be india strategy now that we are managing to get some more testing kits obviously for a country of size of india we need to enhance the testing capacity and i personally feel this is not across the board it is going to be a, you know differential approach that we need to adopt even in a state like maharashtra if you look at some of the hot spot cities like mumbai and pune and if you compare with some of the districts where there are absolutely no reporting of the cases the strategy is going to be differential naturally the resources required the number of test sites required in mumbai is going to be much more than some of those districts so the principle is where there is more need like in hot spot area we need to provide more opportunities for testing why do you do testing is it something that today i'm just having uh, just cough and uh, slight fever do you think that i should immediately jump into the wagon and try and get my blood tested for corona i think there are to be a standardized guidelines for which we need to give more opportunities of the people who will fall into that particular category and the test kits are available sites are available so earlier the uh, you know opportunity given to get themselves tested 
better it will be to restrict further transmission. So the purpose of testing is ensuring that people who turned out to be uh, rapid test positive will be confirmed again with the uh, second test and also afterwards, if need be, there will be either isolation, there will be quarantine and there will be the required, depending upon the clinical picture, the treatment facilities provided. So the testing has a basis. There is a scientific yeah. basis for which okay. we undertake the test. Test is not just like that. Test has to be carried out based upon the calculated scientific strategy. Okay. Okay. Now, <coughs> question number seven that we were going to look at is, uh, should all states go for rapid testing? Uh, but before I go to uh, and uh, discuss that part about uh, states going in for rapid testing. I actually first want to address question number eight. And question number eight is the difference between a swap test and a rapid test. Uh, Dr. Willeman, you can if you can explain this to us, uh, you know, how are the two tests different? How is it that one delivers results in just 30 minutes while right now we are having to wait for two long days? We are not waiting for two long days because of the technology. Technology churns out within five, six hours the result. So the technology is not taking a longer time. It is a test which cannot be done at the bedside of the patient or at the clinic of the doctor because it needs a huge infrastructure. And obviously specimen has to travel to the laboratory under a lockdown, it is taking a longer period. So it sounds that it takes two days, otherwise it is supposed to take six hours from the time it has come inside the laboratory. But your question is, how these two are different? I must tell you, these two are totally different, totally different, have nothing in common. One is done in swab, another is done in blood. One can be, cannot be done everywhere, other can be done every, everywhere. And also I want to tell you, not only there are two tests, one is rapid test, another is PCR test. In the antibody testing segment itself, there are two separate uh, technologies. One is done at the bedside of the patient, doesn't need any machine, and those kits are still not available. Everybody talked rapid test, rapid test, so all will come, all will solve the problem. Rapid tests are still not coming inside India. Government has placed order, or probably government also may not get in next two, three days because making a rapid test takes a little longer time than making serology test. Now, serology test is done in laboratories and that takes uh, two to three hours after the specimen come inside the laboratory. So, a lot of learning needs to be done. What way serology test is different from rapid test? And what way these two tests together put as blood test is different from PCR? In my personal opinion, the immunoglobulin tests, which are done in the laboratory, should be in the country by Thursday. And the rapid test could take even one or two days more. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Dr. Chatterjee, would you, would you like to weigh in on this as well between the two tests? While rapid test does give us faster results, probably is a lot more affordable and, uh, you know, uh, is there something to watch out for over there or should we stick with the swap test that we have right now? See, the swap test is obviously much more reliable and it is something which gives, it, it takes time, it's a much more reliable, it's a much more reliable test and that is for a diagnostic test and it it is it becomes positive at an earlier stage. Whereas the rapid tests, they become positive at a later date. But yes, for community surveillance, for community surveillance, there will come the role of this rapid testing. So once, as I said, as the lockdown period is progressing and we now know the hotspots and all that, obviously following the criteria and the calculations, we have to see where we should apply the rapid testing because that will give us an idea of how the way ahead, how, how should we proceed in the next couple of days or weeks to go. But obviously, the RT-PCR test is the more, more gold standard test and it helps us pick up the disease at an earlier stage. 
Okay, let's also say good evening to Dr. Randeep Guleria who is joining us right now uh, and, and he'll be with us uh, just for a brief period. I have lots of questions for, for you, uh, Dr. Guleria, but thank you so much for taking the time out for speaking with us. Uh, we, we are seeking answers to 10 specific questions. They're all linked to testing uh, and they're meant to help the viewers understand uh, what's good for them, where should they go for testing, what kind of tests do we have currently available, if we are testing enough and to what extent do we need to ramp it up. Currently the question that we were discussing was about uh, you know the rapid test kits versus the current uh, uh, RT-PCR testing or the, or the swab testing that we are looking at. Dr. Guleria, my simple question to you is should we expect a significant ramp up in testing as we get these new kits starting tomorrow? Yes, I think so. We will have a significant ramp up in the testing, but it's important to be able to interpret the test properly. Uh, as has already been said, the RT-PCR will be positive in the first few days and will give you an idea of the, the uh, disease in the early days. It takes at least five days and after the fifth to seventh day for the antibodies to be formed and they will uh, therefore be able to give you a diagnosis only after the fifth to seventh day of the illness. However, the advantage with the uh, kit anti antibody kit test is it's a point of care test. It can be done at site and therefore uh, it will give you uh, the result immediately uh, within half an hour or 40 minutes. So if you use this test in a person who has, let's say, influenza-like illness in the community in a hot spot, then you can make a reasonably good judgment if the illness is for more than five days that this is likely to be COVID-19 and quarantine that person or if there is a treatment strategy, treat that person. But Dr. Guleria, you are saying that, uh, you know, for a rapid test, uh, we, we should have had the symptoms at least for five days, if not more. Um, will that uh, then mean that there has to be a separate elaborate procedure and an SOP for when you can use these, these testing kits? So that has already been made and been discussed in ICMR that if you have an individual who uh, has, let's say, in a hot spot, an influenza-like illness, he comes to you with fever, cough and cold, and it's no, you're not sure how long that has been there, the easiest thing that you can do is do a point of care rapid test. If it's positive, then you are certain that this is definitely COVID-19 that you're dealing with because of the recent history of fever and cough. Although this can also give you an idea, give you an idea of past infection. If it's negative and you still have a strong suspicion that this mm -hmm. could be COVID-19, then you should also get an RT-PCR test done. The advantage is that you will therefore have a number of individuals whom you will get away without having to get an RT-PCR done. The RT-PCR result may uh, take some time because it has to go to a specialized lab and sometimes that is not possible in a field situation where this antibody test which is a point of care test will be very very useful. And who uh, will be responsible for deciding which one should be done and if there should be a follow-up uh, will it be left to the testing labs in the hospitals or are the citizens the ones uh, who will have to keep these things in mind, doctor? Because I'm just uh, thinking from a uh, suspected patient's point of view, uh, am I to know the difference and which tests would be more suitable for me? So this is there is a proper uh, algorithm made by the ICMR as to when the test to be done and what should be done if it is positive, if it is negative, and how you follow this up. You could also do another thing that if you don't have RT-PCR at a center, let's say we are going to a rural area, where it's not possible to do an RT-PCR. You could, you could do the first test and then and if you, and quarantine the person and repeat the test after a few days to see whether it has now become positive. And that will tell you whether this is an, a COVID influenza-like illness or a non-COVID influenza-like illness. So the test has to be looked at in how we can use it because the advantage of the antibody test is you can do it with a drop of blood, you can do it in a situation which is in a rural area or a small town where uh, getting a sample and sending it for RT-PCR may take a longer period of time. And the second advantage is that it immediately gives the result. But like I said, it's not a test which will be useful immediately. It okay. will take some time to be positive. And the other important thing to remember is that this is an antibody test. So once the antibodies are formed in your body or in your blood, they will remain positive for quite some time. So if you were to repeat this test after, say, in an asymptomatic person after some time, 
he will, he may be positive because of past infection and that's why it has to go along with the clinical history okay okay understood thank you so much for explaining that um let me move to the other co uh, question that we had and in fact you know our question number seven was should all states go for rapid testing and uh, the next question also is why are a few states raising concerns over rapid testing so let me combine these two and ask you uh, once these rapid test kits are in will it be a should it be a pan india operation to to distribute them or will you look at specific clusters and why is it that, you know, states like Maharashtra are unsure about this test? So two things. One is that uh, different states have to decide how they want to go around doing the testing. But it also depends on what is the number of cases that you have. Do you have a hotspot in your uh, area and do you want to test in those hotspots with all people who have influenza-like illness? Or is it a state where the, there is hardly any uh, COVID being reported? And do you want to just see then make sure that in all your people who are symptomatic, there is actually no COVID-19, even with mild illness. So states will have to take a call on where they want to do what test with what interpretation they, they can do in terms of deciding how they need to move forward. Uh, the, the concern that some states have is, like I told you, that it will take some days for this test to be positive. It's not a test which will give you a result in the first few days. So... So there's always a concern that if you are if you have a person who is negative by this test, it does not rule out uh, COVID-19 and you should still continue to quarantine that person because, like I said, the test may be negative in the first few days. Okay, but for a state like Maharashtra, that's literally on top of the chart for number of cases, uh, including the city of Mumbai and Pune, wouldn't it be advisable to be the first one to, uh, you know, uh, uh, opt for rapid testing? I think so. In my mind, uh, states, uh, there are two broad categories that one can look at. One is the hotspots where one can do a rapid testing in the population and be able to quickly identify those who are positive and see whether we can quarantine them so as to pre uh, prevent the chain of transmission. And also look at clusters which you may have in migrant population which have gone to different areas and quickly test them to make sure that among them there is no one who is positive and who can therefore carry the disease to his community when he has traveled from a city to his town. All right, uh, Mr. Randeep Guleria, my, my last question to you. There have been, you know, some concerns that have been uh, raised about uh, the extent of testing we are doing. Now, of course, I understand that we didn't have enough testing kits and that was the biggest problem. And the government has, uh, uh, you know, and ICMR has worked a lot on bringing in additional uh, testing kits. But uh, what would be the level and extent of testing that uh, would make you comfortable to even begin considering lifting of a lockdown? So I think the important issue here is not whether we have enough testing kits. It's the important issue is what is the question that we're trying to answer by doing this test. There's no point saying that everyone in the community should be tested. You will have a large number of uh, uh, negative tests and it's a waste of resources. When we started the testing long time back, it was basically to test people who are coming from outside because this is a virus which came from outside. So people who are traveling from outside or the close contacts were tested. Subsequently, we wanted to see is there community spread, is there certain cases that we are missing out on? And we did what was testing for uh, SARI cases that is severe acute respiratory illness to see that are we missing out on some uh, people who come to the hospital with severe pneumonia and may have COVID-19. Now in the hotspots, there is a need to ramp up the testing, both the antibody testing and the RT-PCR testing. And that is something that the government is working on and that is what is being done. Private labs have also been roped in. So I think the question that we're trying to answer now is what is happening in these hotspots and therefore what should we do in the long term in trying to prevent the spread of disease in these areas and contain it only to the hotspots and it doesn't go beyond. So testing have to be done to answer that question rather than doing it on a large population where the chance of getting a positivity is low. Okay, um, Dr. Guleria, thank you so much for joining us. Appreciate you taking the time out and speaking to us and giving those insights. In fact, let me pick up from what he last said and go back to our uh, panelists. And, um, you know, Dr. Uh, Velumani, let me come to you on the aspect of 
you know, uh, uh, what the doctor said about uh, rapid testing being used in specific states and how it's up to them. Do you believe in states where we are looking at a higher number of cases and there are significant number of hotspots, they should opt for rapid testing and, um, you know, Maharashtra shouldn't be hesitating the way it is? No, I think uh, there is a lot of confusion that an antibody test is a replacement for a costly PCR test. It is absolutely wrong. If you listen, listen to the earlier panelist, he almost said it. If it is not positive, it is possible that you have an illness, but antibody still could not detect. So you have to go for a PCR. If it is positive, then you have to go for a PCR to confirm. If a test is negative also, you have to go to the next. If the test is positive also, you have to go to the next. That test is not a replacement for the existing test. But having said that, one might ask, is that this test is useless? Absolutely not. This test has its own use. I must mm. tell, this is a wonderful test to understand whether somebody is already immune or yet to get exposed. The test is positive. That means that individual is already immune. And if the test is positive and if there are symptoms, please go ahead and do the PCR. If the test is positive and the patient doesn't have any symptom, especially it is only IgG positive, not yeah. IgM. So there is enough confusion. Whatever ICMR has given the guidelines, I think each state should have sat with and discussed. They would have understood, are we saving money by doing antibody tests? Are we wasting time and resources? So if you don't understand what purpose it serves, it will be a waste of time and resources. It is very important that everybody is on the same page. The purpose of testing and the interpretation of the result has okay. to be intelligently done. Okay. Uh, in fact, uh, let me ask Dr. Salunke if he wants to weigh in on that. So, Dr. Salunke, as I understand it, because a rapid testing kit is essentially an anti, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, the uh, uh, antibody uh, uh, based test, it can only work after a certain number of days when you've developed these antibodies in uh, in your own system. So, there is a possibility that you may test negative initially, but a few days later actually find out that you have been infected with COVID. Sure. Sure. I, I think uh, the, the, this, these rapid tests are essentially used for screening purposes. It helps from the public health perspective. As the other panelists have very clearly stated, the positivity also does not confirm that you... It has to be confirmed with the another RT-PCR test. But at the same time, negativity helps us whether and if there are no symptomatology at that particular juncture, that person unlikely to be uh, possible for, uh, for him to transmit the disease. So that is one way it is helping us for screening purpose. And number two, I wanted to, uh, because I'm part of the technical committee in the government of Maharashtra, so I do not know... Uh, how you got this impression that there is a hesitancy in the state of Maharashtra. But as soon as these states uh, are going to be available, rapid test, I'm pretty certain this will be used in the state by following the mandate and the protocol already decided by ICMR and expert committees. So these tests or rapid tests are basically okay. from public, okay. health, public health perspective, screening role, screening test role. No, I'll tell you why, Dr. Salunke. And we've been following up with the health minister on this specific story, actually, an angle for two days now. Uh, and Mr. Rajesh Tope, the health minister of Maharashtra, uh, he told us today that so far they've not taken a decision uh, because one of the things is that the results are not 100% accurate. And so they've not brought it in so, uh, as of now. A decision is yet to be taken. Now, I would call this hesitancy because Maharashtra, as you know, has a high number of cases and perhaps in crowded clusters and slum areas and other hotspots, uh, this is the need of the ER if my understanding is correct, isn't it? 
Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. But I think this needs to be further discussed. But there is a role, as I explained to you, that this will be a very useful from the sure. screening purposes. And this needs to be definitely discussed. Yes. Okay, all right. Uh, let me go back to Dr. Chatterjee as well. Dr. Chatterjee, uh, you know, the, what we're discussing right now is are the, are, are the pros and the cons of this rapid testing because a lot has been spoken about it. The ICMR and the government have, uh, you know, pushed this concept a lot. We get the first round of the uh, test kits starting tomorrow. And so maybe in three, four days from now, it will start, uh, uh, you know, it will get uh, into the system and the states, individual states will start using it. Uh, do you think all states should go for it right now? Some of them haven't really taken a final decision. I would think that all states which are having a lot of lot more cases and the clusters have been identified and there have been a lot of migrants or evacuees who are staying and where the number of cases are high, I would definitely suggest that this should be adopted as a screening test and for community surveillance because that would only tell us as to how to go about uh, isolating people, how to treat people. So I would definitely expect that the states which have higher number of cases should definitely opt for it. This is what I would think at my personal level. Now, as far as states which have very few cases or something, they can, and if they have the facilities, obviously they have to have the facilities for an RT-PCR, then they can opt for that. But any, any state which has high number of cases for community surveillance and for screening, I think should opt for this rapid screening test as everybody, mm -hmm. all, all of us in the panel have said that this is a screening test uh, in the initial few days. This test may not be positive because it's an antibody test. But there are clear cut guidelines which ICMR has given that if there is a suspicion of the patient suffering from COVID-19, then you have to repeat the test maybe after 10 days. If there's a very strong suspicion, uh, then you might have to repeat the test with an RT-PCR. So there are, there are clear cut guidelines. But as a community uh, surveillance test and as a screening test, this is not a bad test to go ahead with. Okay, then I move on to our last question and, uh, you know, this is equally important, even though it's question number 10. Uh, will a large-scale rapid testing help us determine our next strategy, post-lockdown strategy or post-April 14th strategy? Dr. Chatterjee, let's begin with you. Uh, we just have one more week to go for this lockdown. Do you think we'll be able to take a decision basis large-scale rapid testing? Um, we still the migrants were moving around in the last couple of days. Then the Nizamuddin episode happened. I still think that the number of days that are left with us are not not uh, not not very many. May, maybe it has to be a very calculated deci calculated decision by the government how to lift the lockdown or whether it has to be staggered and all that. And maybe the testing and all that, depending on the criteria, depending on the need, have to go up. The number of days which are left are not too many. So I think. Uh, we need to really strategize our things in the next couple of days, whether the lockdown can, can be lifted in the next couple of days or not. Dr. Velamani, what's your own thought? Will rapid testing help us determine our next strategy? And there is a likelihood we may not even have adequate kits in India before the last day of lockdown. But having said that, we have been locked down almost for 17, 18 days. The capacity we had to handle the number of patients in hospital in these last 20 days, I believe, has been significantly ramped up. So it is the experiment which government needs to do, not by <clears throat> suddenly unlocking all, unlock as essential by 10% every day, until such period our capacities are managing, you can completely unlock. The purpose of lockdown was to dilute and delay the difficulties. I think we have delayed, we have diluted. Now it is time for doing an experiment. But trust me, number of tests done should not be a criteria to decide the lock, lockdown unlocking. It is not the number of tests. It is the power of the okay. country, the infrastructure which we could manage in this last two, three weeks should be confident enough to open up at least partially. 
Okay, so let me say this way, you know, base is the data we have right now and more that will come in, in the next few days. The fact that 80% of the cases seem to be concentrated only uh, in about 60 to 70 districts. We've, we've roughly managed to identify most of the hotspots. Uh, uh, then if we do a little bit more uh, in the next, uh, in the coming few days in terms of investigation of till where the infection has spread, uh, Dr. Salunke, do you believe that we could look at a situation for a staggered lifting of a lockdown starting April 14th? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, the test may play a small role. Lifting of the ban is not going to be dependent on one factor. It is multifactorial in nature. As a matter of fact, it will be absolutely unwise to consider national level decision. It will be, it has to be, you know, segregated at the state level. Even not the state. Take example of our own state, Maharashtra. Such a huge state, bigger than some countries. Then you have to go down to the district level. Even in city like Mumbai, you have to consider the zones A, B, C. So, if you have to take into consideration which are the factors which are likely to propagate the transmission, covering those factors is one related to public health, but there are many other components and points that government will have to take into consideration. So, dilution of the lockdown is going to be a very important exercise which will take into consideration number of issues, number of factors, community behavior, existing infection, existing cases, potentials of the transmission from asymptomatic cases. So it will be, the units will be district or even below district. No question of taking such decision even at the state level, absolutely not at the national level. It will be a decision which will have to be taken into consideration with all these factors at the uh, considering districts and below district level. Hmm. Okay, then let's wait and watch what fin the final decision is. We've done two weeks, one more week to go for the lockdown. Um, the period that was announced for that period to come to an end. Uh, what will the government's next, uh, next decision be, of course, is the big question. Several state governments have actually already asked the government to look at an extension. Uh, but the government hasn't taken any decision and they'll probably wait for a uh, coming few days to see what the data throws up and what the experts say. A series of meetings are actually taking place on a daily basis between the officials of various ministries and experts, even industry representatives. Today it was the cabinet ministers, uh, you know, uh, led by uh, uh, Defence Minister Rajnath Singh and Home Minister Amit Shah who had a meeting and held discussions. Uh, so we'll have to wait and watch what the next course of action is. Thank you so much for our esteemed panellists uh, for joining us right now uh, on this special conversation. Ten questions. Extremely important questions linked to the testing process, the testing strategy and the benefits of various tests that we have right now. We've answered for you 10 specific questions. I hope that was, a, you know, some bit of help for you as well, viewers. Thank you so much for joining us on this conversation. Welcome back. Viewers, in a matter of about 14 days, we've made multiple changes, about three changes to our export policy regarding drugs. Now, the, all of this has happened because of a large conversation that's going on for one specific drug, uh, the hydroxychloroquine. And the changes have also largely been linked to hydroxychloroquine. Why is that really happening? Because as the entire world searches for a medicine as the entire world searches and researches for a vaccine for a cure and a medicine for coronavirus one of these uh, drugs that could be used or is being explored to uh, is is being explored for usage is the hydroxychloroquine in fact it's been united states and president donald trump who's been at the forefront of, of pushing this specific drug as a possible solution they've actually started hoarding on it 
uh, keeping large amount of stocks in various parts of the country. They've issued it to the military, they've issued it to the pharmacy stores. Uh, and, and Donald Trump seems to be leading this agenda of convincing the world that this will be the solution and it will be him and under his leadership that the United States will find the solution. Now, of course, the United States has been badly hit by coronavirus, uh, you know, after China and Italy. It's perhaps one of the worst hit countries that we are looking at. But take a look at what's happening back home. Now, while we've had a much, much better strategy to deal with this pandemic than many of the other countries, look at what our export, uh, export policies changes have been. On March 25th, the first ban on export of anti-malarial drug was brought in. And, and, and the government said that the export will only be on humanitarian grounds. Then on April 4th, 2020, there was a complete ban on export of this anti-malarial drug. Uh, the export of drug was prohibited without any ex exception. Then, we had overnight, we had President Donald Trump make a big comment where he said, well, I have spoken to the Indian government and I have spoken to the Indian Prime Minister and they are going to be supplying this to us. And, I, and, and in his very classic style, he went on to say that, well, they have to give us our supply. And if they don't, there will be a retaliation. And we could look at options for retaliation. Now, irrespective of what President Trump says, and so far he's not been able to arm twist us into anything, but we do know that today the government came out and said that India has enough for its domestic requirements and once those requirements are met or keeping those requirements in mind, we will export the anti-malarial drug on humanitarian grounds to nations who need it the most. So that's the latest that we have right now. Now, do we have enough? Or could there be a possibility that tomorrow when there are more cases in our country and hydro hydroxychloroquine could be one of the medicines that helps us, we don't have enough because we're exporting it. Why is United States holding so much of it? And did Donald Trump manage to arm twist us into it? Some of the questions that everybody is asking. I don't have a view. I'm not an expert. But I do know that everybody around me is talking about it and it's become a big talking point. So we decided to bring in two experts to help us understand just what the reality could be as far as this anti-malarial drug is concerned. Dr. Viranchi Shah, Senior Vice President with IDMA joins us this evening and Lina Mengane, Regional Head for Doctors Without Borders Access Campaign, also with us this evening. Dr. Shah, let's begin with you. Um, is, should there be a concern about whether or not we have enough of this anti-malarial drug that could potentially have some use for coronavirus patients? Well, definitely, everybody should have a concern because this is one of the very promising drugs that we have. Having said that, uh, India, as we know, is the pharmacy of the world and we cater to the needs of pharmaceuticals across the globe. Every possible country on the earth uh, imports pharmaceuticals and medicines from India. Uh, if you look at hydroxychloroquine, which is uh, in focus right now, uh, I have, the data that we have is that for the last year, the total Indian consumption was about 2 million tablets per month, which is about 24 million tablets in a year. Given that, the production capability that the industry has is close to about 100 million tablets a month. So, uh, you know, you can understand that we have a large excess production capacity vis-a-vis -vis what India needs. And therefore, uh, it is logical that if we can use these drugs for nations who need it at, this, at least at the time of crisis, uh, it is not a bad option to let it be exported. Okay, um, uh, let me also ask uh, uh, Lina Mengane what she thinks. Uh, Lina Mengane, what's your view? Uh, is India in a position to export it right now, a drug which seems to be highly in demand across the world? Well, after meeting its domestic needs, any drug that is repurposed for COVID-19, countries will rely on India because India is a major manufacturer. So this is not surprising that countries are seeking supplies from Indian manufacturers. So I think one of the things that we have to recognize that India plays a major role in global health and supplies from India are crucial 
for COVID-19 response. Having said that, I would also like to highlight that in the past, some rich countries, including the United States, have had a tendency to stockpile medicines at the cost of developing country access. And I think this is where we need to have better coordination and transparency among governments and, and the WHO, where actually the drug whichever drug that is, in today we are talking about hydroxychloroquine, tomorrow it could be another new drug, we need to have an established mechanism that it reaches the global populations of patients who need the drug. So I think we need to look at it from a global perspective. Okay, but um, uh, let me ask this question then, Dr. Shah, what do you think, why, why did we see so many changes in our policy well, you know, uh, why what, do you think at one point the government thought that it's perhaps better to not export it at all right now and keep what we have? Since the I would record, like to clarify right. on that. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, uh, Dr. Shah first and then I can, I'll come across yeah. to you, Lina. So, just to set the record right, madam, uh, the government of India has still put hydroxychloroquine and paracetamol under restricted category. So it is not that it is freely available for export. They, yes. Yesterday, they released about 12 APIs and their formulations, which were earlier put under restrictions. But since India has enough stocks of these materials, and after a lot of uh, requests from the, go uh, from the industry, uh, the government has allowed the exports of these 12 APIs and their formulations. As we speak, hydroxychloroquine and paracetamol are two drugs where both the APIs and formulations are still restricted. They are not open for export as such. No, okay, all right. Uh, but, uh, you know, even if it's on the restricted list, uh, the, the, um, I, my understanding is that the government decides who we can, uh, who's, uh, who we can export to. Now, for example, is a country yeah. like United yeah. States a country we should be looking at at this point of time? See, exactly. See, yeah. when you say that it is restricted, uh, the companies who manufacture, they are supposed to apply for a waiver to the government and the government, based on its priorities, would be allowing exports to specific countries depending upon their dialogue government to government. Yeah. So I would like to clarify a okay, point Nina, in Mingala, the do you want to come in on that? Yes, so I would like to clarify that uh, yeah. the government's original notification on 25th March clearly said that on humanitarian grounds, India would consider supplying these drugs on a case-to-case -case basis. And I see no reason for India not to supply mm. these drugs if they have a sufficient manufacturing capacity. Number two, I would like to say is this, where is the prioritization? Okay. There are a number of countries, including developing countries, who are seeking to procure this drug for profile access, that is for the healthcare workers to use it as preventive therapy, uh, as treatment for COVID patients. And why should the United States only dictate that they are the ones who should receive the drug? This is a global pandemic that is affecting rich and poor countries equally. And there needs to be a global response to this. The United States has often threatened India with retaliation on trade issues, including on intellectual property and pharmaceuticals. And it is once more using its clout to decide that they will stockpile in a pandemic when, you know, this, this is a discussion to be had among the most affected countries and in developing countries as well, uh, who may need the supplies of this very important drug. Mm. I would also like to add... That yes, absolutely. No, point. exactly why I asked this question. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. I, I would also like to add that this is not a time that countries should think about just protectionism. They need to think of solidarity. We are not going to beat this pandemic by acting alone. So we really need to share resources, particularly in resource-poor settings, whether it is ventilators, whether it's PTEs, whether it is the drugs uh, that are being produced by key manufacturers. To share resources. And it is unfortunate that, you know, again, rich countries like the United States are thinking of retaliation in a time when there should be greater uh, uh, coordination among countries. This is not the time to politicize the issue. This is the time to actually for better coordination mechanism. Paragavi, let me also put another perspective here. 
Okay. When now, we say that India is the pharmacy of the world yes. and we cater medicines to almost 200 countries across the globe, in a way it is also our responsibility to be a part of their efforts in fighting this COVID response to COVID infections. When we say that we are your partners in your healthcare, mm. and uh, in the time of crisis, if we are not there to support, I think that would not give a good signal. And uh, countries who have similar capabilities or uh, you know can easily replace our place uh, in the global supply chain. So I think as a respons responsible member of the healthcare system, we should definitely uh, share the resources that we have, including the stock of hydroxychloroquine to the countries that need them. Yes, but does the United States need it or they seem to simply be piling up on it? See, if you see the current situation, I think U.S. has the highest number of casualties as of date. Yes. So if anybody needs them, U.S. definitely needs it. Over 11,000 deaths and... It. Okay. Okay. So logically, they do need it. And uh, as forget the politics, if you look at the humanitarian side, if we say that we are your very important suppliers, uh, yes. then definitely we should be standing with them today. Well, I, I'll also like to yes, highlight okay. um, you know, in, that... Uh, on that note, Doc... Yes, yeah, go ahead, please. I, I just... I'd just like to highlight something that's happened before. When people were preparing for the avian influenza pandemic, which was a few years ago, which didn't really turn out to be a big pandemic, there was a drug called Osaltamavir, which rich countries yeah. stockpiled and developing countries could not get access to. And Roche was the sole supplier at that point of time. And this is a real danger for access in, in countries that are most affected by COVID-19, that you would have an excess stockpile in some countries while none, uh, 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 no, no sources in other countries. And I think this is where it's not an issue about the United States being pitted against the rest of the world. The question is that there are other countries uh, who are equally affected by COVID-19 and are preparing actually to protect the healthcare workers and, and gear up the healthcare systems to, to deal with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And they need access to the drug. And how is all that going to be managed? How is the WHO going to work with member countries to manage the situation? Or are rich countries going to get away with treatment for their patients and poor countries will not be able to supply the drug to their patients at all? And this is not just for this drug. We have a new drug called Remdesivir that's coming along the line with clinical trials. And the U.S. company Gilead Sciences is the sole supplier. Tomorrow, the U.S. government could completely take over all the stocks of that drug after the clinical trials are over and if they are found to be effective, you could have the U.S. government take over all the stocks of that drug and the rest of the world could just remain watching. So we need a better mechanism to, you know, handle access to the most important medical tools in this pandemic. I think probably that is the reason why it is restricted. A as better now, mechanism so that... perhaps to handle, you know... Uh... Yes, yes. Go ahead, doc. go ahead, Dr. Shah. So perhaps that is the reason why it is restricted as of now, so that it doesn't go into unreasonable hands. And the government is making sure that it is exported to the countries that they think really need them. Okay, now I think a lot of the concern actually in the conversation and the debate stems from the fact that Donald Trump said what he did just a few day, you know, hours ago in his classic style and then there was a change in our policy. The, 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 the health ministry did come and clarify and the external affairs ministry came and clarified actually to say that obviously we will first ensure that our domestic requirements are met before we actually give it to those countries who need it the most. But let me ask you this question before I wrap it up, Dr. Shah. Um, so much of conversation around hydroxychloroquine. Is there enough data uh, to suggest that it's actually helpful in beating or, uh, uh, you know, treating coronavirus? See, it's mostly prescribed for prophylaxis. Uh, there, is a, there are two dosages that ICMR has come out with. One is a prophylaxis for the medical, uh, the medics and the paramedics, which is 800 mg stat followed by 400 mg every week for the next seven weeks. 
and then also for the immediate contacts of the positive cases of corona infection which is 800 mg step and 400 mg 3 week uh, for next 3 weeks once for every 3 weeks so it is mostly for prophylaxis in terms of numbers i was telling you that we are uh, the uh, last year we had 24 million tablets sold in india which is about 2.4 crore tablets. And the Indian pharmaceutical industry has confirmed and pledged to the government that they would supply 10 crore tablets to the government as a pool. And only after that 10 crore is crossed, they are going to request for the exports. So we, we are going to have four times the stock that okay. we usually need. And that also, the assurance has been given from the industry that if these 10 crores start depleting, industry will replenish it in very quick time because we have enough source of the APIs, of the starting materials and of the formulations, both in terms of the materials and the capabilities to produce. So there is definitely not going to be any concern so far as India is concerned. And like, I'd like to clarify on, on the therapeutic use of Okay, but uh, is... Yes, go ahead, please. So uh, I would like to say that there is, of course, not sufficient data on the drugs that are being used to treat COVID-19 severe yeah. cases. However, looking at the condition of patients in, in a severe situation uh, who are dying of respiratory disease, uh, we found that lorotonavir, which was a HIV, didn't work very well. We replaced uh, hydroxychloroquine. Um, in a month's time, there'll be more clinical trial data coming out from other clinical trials that are being conducted. So I think we will see the clinical management guidelines for severe patients evolving. And we must not forget that we should not just bank on one drug. We need to look at a large number of therapeutic options for severe patients. Among them is a MAB, which is tocilizumab, which, you know, Roche is the only producer in the world. And I think we need to start having these very difficult conversations mm. uh, about, you know, uh, you know, these drugs are going to be stockpiled. And, you know, of course, in, uh, you know, the United States has already placed a large order for this MAB uh, for severe patients. And while, you know, uh, we may not even have the opportunity to access the drug in developing countries. So I think, you know, we need to need more accountability for accountability from companies like Gilead. We need more accountability from uh, the big companies like Roche, Swiss Pharma companies. And of course, we need a coordination mechanism because we have to respond together to this pandemic. And, you know, export restrictions uh, have, as the Ministry of External Affairs has very clearly clarified that they will take a humanitarian view on supply of this drug. But, you know, in the next round of clinical management guidelines, we may have drugs that are not produced in India and we may be dependent on Swiss companies and U.S. companies. And I think we need to watch out for a situation where India is dependent on Roche and Gilead to access the next generation of therapeutic candidates for COVID-19. All right. Um, you, you know, on that note, then I'm going to leave it right here. We, we've had extensive conversations. Thank you both of you for actually joining us and being so frank and vocal about, uh, you know, the, your views and also sharing these insights and information with us. Uh, suffice to say that, yes, I believe we should be able to help out other nations. Tomorrow, there may actually be a drug or, or an equipment, uh, a health equipment uh, that we need as a nation and we will have to turn towards the world. We are doing so even now. We are importing our testing kits from various countries. We are importing, uh, you know, health equipment. Even though we're making it in our country, we still need a lot more from surgical masks and gloves to safety gear and protective uh, uh, gear for, for our healthcare workers to medicines and drugs. So why should we not be in a situation to help others if, if, if it is... Uh, it not eating into our own domestic requirements which is fine i believe that the, the step that the country has taken and the government has decided is all fine as long as it doesn't begin to impact our own needs thank you so much to both of these uh, experts for joining us on this conversation Well, I want to put the spotlight on a couple of stories that have emerged today now this is as a consequence of perhaps uh, the large number of cases that we saw of the Marka's attendees across the country. People are now using this as an excuse to show their own prejudices. People are now using this as an excuse to show their own religious uh, uh, biases and lash out 
at the Muslim community. I'm going to give you one example and this is coming in from Bengaluru where a woman activist has alleged that she and her colleagues were attacked by goons in the Dasarahalli area of Bengaluru. She claims that they had actually uh, gone there to distribute food to the needy people but they were uh, 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 cornered and targeted and chased away saying do not come in this zone and do not distribute food here. Here is what she told us. Listen in. रेशन बैटिंग ये करके बोल को रेशन डिस्ट्रीब्यूट कर रही है ना स्वराज अभियान से, सो एक दो दिन पहले वो कौन आए थे मालूम नहीं है ना आरएस और जिले से भी होना तो मालूम नहीं है, आपको हमारे पर एकदम अटैक कर रखा चीज लोग आपको तुम्हें कई सारे देरिंग किधर देरिंग तो मुसल मना खुद को देखिंग well, before we wrap it up, let me give you this in, uh, interesting bit of information. Health experts from across the world are now saying that wearing a mask while going out is perhaps a good way to reduce the spread of the infection. It can be an improvised mask. You don't need one of those medical masks. Uh, you can actually make one at home with a dupatta or a handkerchief. But be sure that you cover your face uh, and your nose when you step out of your homes. In fact, you can share a picture of yourself wearing it uh, and share it with us. Use the hashtag, hashtag mask India and share a picture of you wearing your own homemade mask on social media.